I don't see what another session will prove. Haku glared up at me from her seat on the other side of my desk. This was her seventh session. Her parents had initially brought her to me to help her through the death of her brother, but in our weekly therapy sessions, I'd uncovered what was really causing her erratic behavior. Like Len Kagamine, she suffered from realistic nightmares that she believed were glimpses into a past life. Let's go over what we've learned in past sessions about this past life you claim to be seeing. I'm not claiming anything. It's real. I remember it. Please, calm down, Miss Ioane. I know you believe these visions are real. Until recently, I did not. You believe me? What changed your mind? I'll get into that in just a moment. I'd like to go over what you've previously told me. Give me the summarized version, please. I leaned forward and turned on my tape recorder. Okay. Well, I was born in Talentra, a village where everyone has green hair. Except for me. I was born with white hair. Because of it, everyone bullied me and treated me like a lesser person. One day, while I was by myself at this old tree outside of town, I met McKenna. At first, I didn't trust her, but she was kind to me. We became friends. She got me a job as a maid in the palace and introduced me to Prince Caden. I later learned that she and the prince were in love. He even turned down another marriage proposal for her. Everything was wonderful for a while, but then the queen of the neighboring kingdom, the one Caden turned down, ordered all the people in Talentra with green hair killed. I was the only one left alive. When she finished, I stopped the recording. After reviewing her story, I could see where it lined up with Lens. My hunch was correct. Miss Ioane, I've met with a young man who has been having the same... visions as you. However, he's been witnessing these events from another perspective, that of the twin brother of the queen from your story. With your permission, I'd like to have a joint session between the two of you, to see where that might lead. She regarded me carefully, considering my suggestion. All right, Doctor. I'll... I'll trust you. I leaned over to the intercom on my desk, and asked the nurse to see Len and his sister into my office. I watched Haku's face as her eyes narrowed in recognition. You didn't tell me his sister was with him. Whatever happened in this past life, Miss Ioane, I expect you to behave yourself in my office. Now, Rin, Len, this is Haku Ioane. She has also had visions of McKenna. I watched Len carefully, gauging his response. He refused to meet Haku's eyes. I'm sorry. Haku looked like she wanted to strangle him, so I decided it would be best to jump right into the session before she gave in to that desire. Have a seat, Len. You too, Miss Kagamine. I'd like you to take part in this session as well. What? Why me? I believe, if this past life is real, that you may have latent memories as well. Having you take part in this session may help Miss Ioane and Len to remember more. I need you to trust me, Miss Kagamine. Okay, Doctor. If you think it will help, I'll do it. Thank you. Now, everyone relax. We'll begin with some guided meditation. The loss of McKenna weighed heavily on my mind. Talentra was trying to rebuild, but even in the burnt ruins of my home, I was pushed away, unaccepted by those I thought might finally treat me as one of their own. Working in the palace only brought me more pain. Every room reminded me of her. As I took over her duties, I was reminded every day that she wasn't coming back. That I'd lost my best friend. I handled this change only for a month before I broke. I resigned my position. Caden was kind and understanding. He never grew angry with me, even when the shared memory of McKenna caused us both to struggle with tears. He came to my room in the servant's wing on the day I was to leave. You don't have to move out, Hakana. You could remain. You were her best friend. I'd like to look after you. Forgive me, Your Highness, I can't. You're trying to latch on to some part of her memory by clinging to me, and... This place... Everywhere I walk in this place reminds me of her. I can't stay here when every vase makes me want to cry. 
then stay in the village where I can provide for you. For her sake. He was still reaching. I don't belong here, your highness. Can you not call me Caden? I'd like to think we were friends, Hakana, you and I. His voice was soft, kind, and on the verge of tears. We weren't friends, your highness. You accepted me because she was my friend. And now you're just looking for some normalcy in this insanity. I've handed in my resignation, and I've taken the time to train your next senior housemaid. I'll be leaving this evening. I had to keep my voice firm and my jaw tensed. If I didn't, I might find myself crying. I might give in. Goodbye, Caden. I had moved to a small town near the harbor. Because I had very little money, I was allowed to live in the convent attached to the local chapel. To pay for room and board, I helped out in the church and around the convent, keeping things clean and helping to cook meals. It was a quiet life where I could stay away from large groups of people. The priest and the sisters were welcoming and kind. I honestly loved it. News travels fast. I thought I could escape it, but I soon found the past as a way of following you. The events that happened in Talentra and Ray area had reached my safe haven on the harbor. When I went into the town market to buy groceries most days, I would hear nothing but the town gossipers talking about the fire and Catherine Valencia's sentencing. Knowing she was dead brought some closure to my aching heart. My only regret was that I had been unable to help Prince Caden in avenging McKenna. The loss of my friends still weighed heavily on my heart. For a time, my life had become quiet and uneventful. I never quite considered myself happy, but the pain my heart felt had lessened over time. I truly believed I could live happily here. The past caught up with me once again. One cloudy afternoon, I was on my way home from the market. As I crossed the pathway that led across the beach, I heard something over the roar of the waves. The water churned with an upcoming storm, but still I could hear it. A faint cry for help. Perhaps I should have listened to my better judgment, which had told me it was bandits trying to catch me alone, away from people. Perhaps I should have ignored it and kept going. Maybe then I could have held on to my hate. I followed the faint cries to a group of rocks. At first I didn't see anything. The cry had stopped and all I could hear now was the call of seagulls flying over the ocean. I was about to turn around and continue on my way when I heard it again. Please. So hungry. <laughs> In my quick evaluation of the scene, I had completely missed her. A girl with short golden blonde hair dressed in a brown cloak. I couldn't quite see the rest of her clothes. What I could see was that she was weak, near to death and exhausted. I slung the bag I'd been carrying the produce I'd purchased in over my shoulders and knelt down to help the girl up. It's all right. I'll help you. Just lean on me. With some difficulty, I managed to help her along the rest of the way to the chapel. She wasn't very heavy, but with the bag of food and the girl, it made for slow moving. By the time I reached the door to the convent, I was covered in sweat and breathing heavily. The girl, however, was nearly unconscious. I managed to push open the door, thanking God that it was unlocked. Help! I, I need help! One of the nuns that lived there, Sister Margaret Mary, came running over to help me, lifting the girl off of my shoulders. Hakana, what happened? Who is this? I slumped into a nearby chair. The girl was laid on the floor for now as Sister Margaret started drilling me for answers. I don't know. I found her on the beach. She looked so exhausted and hungry. My, my first thought was to bring her here. Everything after that was very much a blur. The girl was taken to one of the many rooms in the convent, and I was sent back into town to fetch a doctor. The girl was malnourished, fatigued, and had a terribly high fever. The doctor left instructions for her care and left. By the end of the day, the hustle and bustle had calmed down again. My duties changed after that day. I was placed in charge with seeing to the girl. It took days for her fever to break. I spent many sleepless nights at her bedside, doing everything I could to keep her forehead cool and to bring down the heat in her cheeks. I couldn't help but notice how pretty the girl was. She was so young, too. I wondered what life she must have come from to be so desperately ill. In the time that she was sick, we couldn't get anything out of her. She would wake long enough for us to give her medicine, 
and get her to eat a few bites of food. After that, she would fall back asleep. A few times she woke from terrible nightmares, some so bad that I had to hold her down to keep her from hurting herself as she thrashed around in her sleep. She left me with a black eye that night. A week and a half after the girl came to us, her fever broke. By the end of that day, she was awake enough to ask for a glass of water. I stayed by her side while I waited for her to regain her strength. Over the course of the day, I managed to get her to eat more. By evening, she was feeling well enough to sit up in bed and talk to me. What's your name? Hakana Durand. And yours? Kate. Kate. Kate Skyler. Her answer seemed strange. Like she had to think about it for a moment. Thought she might be using a fake name, but I had to remind myself that she had just woken from a terrible fever. Where are you from, Kate? I leaned forward to wipe some of the sweat from her forehead. I don't remember. The last thing I remember was being on the beach. That's where I found you. Do you know anything about your family? Are they looking for you? She shook her head. No. They're all dead. My parents and my... My brother. My heart hurt for this girl. We had both lost someone we cared for. By the way she started to cry for her brother, I wondered if it was recent. I reached out and took her hand in mine. I'm sorry, Kate. I didn't mean to bring up painful memories. I'll talk to the sisters and Father Adam for you. I'm sure they'll let you stay until we can find out where you came from, alright? I hope to change the subject and still her tears. Things changed after that day. As Kate regained her strength, she started helping me with cleaning and with cooking. It started out small, little things that didn't require a lot of physical effort. We didn't want her relapsing into another fever so soon. We had started to believe that she either suffered from terrible amnesia, or that she was from some noble house. She didn't know how to clean or how to cook, and I had to teach her how to do the most basic of chores. Countless times we had to eat late because she burned something or sew patches in new clothes when she'd torn them trying to wash them. She once nearly broke a priceless painting of the crucifixion when she was trying to dust it. She hurt more than she helped, but something about her clumsy nature and how she often tried to fix what she'd broken or burnt made her all the more endearing. Ugh, Kate, what are you burning now? It's almost tea time. Father's going to be upset if you make him late for mass again. The whole kitchen smelt of burnt flour. It made my nose itch. As I fought back a sneeze, I watched Kate open the oven. A plume of black smoke wafted out into her face. Oh no, I messed it up. That's putting it lightly. I grabbed a towel from the counter and walked over, waving the smoke from the oven toward the open door that led into the convent's little garden. What were you even trying to make? Brooch, for the Feast of Infamy. That's not until Twelfth Night, after Christmas. It's October. I know. I wanted to practice. Can you practice at a time other than tea time? Put the kettle on while I prepare a snack for father. That's why I'm making the broche. Mm. Well, now you've burnt it and I have to figure something else out. Baking is not your forte, Kate. Nothing is my forte. That's not true. You have a beautiful voice. I placed my hands on my hips. My eyes searched the kitchen as I looked for something to make for father. We needed to act fast. He wouldn't eat an hour before communion. Settling on finger sandwiches, I began to slice the bread and cut the cucumbers. Your voice is prettier. None of that. Come on now. Let's make this work go faster. The water is wide. I cannot cross sore. I nudged her arm with a smile and she joined in. And neither have I wings to fly, give me a boat that can carry two, and both shall roam, my love and I. That evening after mass, we were both out in the yard, taking down the laundry we'd hung up to dry before lunch. 
The hill the chapel sat on looked over the ocean, and we could see the sun setting over the water perfectly from here. This used to be my favorite time of day. The world was becoming quiet. Now, when I see the reds and oranges of the sunset, all I see is fire. Kate was gazing out at the ocean, quiet for the most part, while I pulled down all the linens. To be honest, I was getting kind of annoyed that I was doing all the work, while she just stood there, watching the sunset. Kate! What's with you? You've been staring at the ocean for a while now. I'd appreciate it if you'd help me. Normally, her odd behavior didn't bother me. But after her mishap in the kitchen earlier, I was starting to feel a little drained. Huh? Oh, sorry. I just haven't watched the water in a while. Not since the day you found me. She walked over to help me, taking part of the sheet I was trying to fold and making the job easier. What's so special about that ocean anyway? You don't know? Legend says that if you write your wish on a piece of paper, place it in a bottle, and cast it into the ocean, your wish will come true. That answer surprised me. I hadn't expected something so fantastical. I set down the newly folded sheet and lifted the basket of clean laundry into my arms. Where did you hear something like that? Father Adam might say that's an old wives' tale or some kind of witchcraft. You better be careful who you repeat stuff like that to. Kate smiled at me. My brother told me. Hakana. I've done some really horrible things. You remember? I thought you couldn't. I remember some things. And they come and go in dreams. Like God's trying to remind me of the things I need to atone for. I was cruel. To a lot of people. I hurt my brother. I hurt an innocent girl. I'm sorry. She ran off, leaving me to put the laundry away. Worried, I quickly finished my task and attempted to find her. I didn't see her again until dinner that night, but she barely said a word to me. Kate was asleep by the time I'd gotten back to my room. It was late. I was on cleanup after dinner. Normally, Kate would have helped me so it would get done faster, but tonight she disappeared right after the meal was finished. I walked over to the side of her bed and sat down on the edge. Reaching over, I pushed some hair from her face. I don't know what things you've done, but they can't have been too terrible. I hope you'll talk to me about it one day. Kate had become very withdrawn over the past few months. She barely spoke to me unless it was about chores or delivering a message. I tried my hardest to get her to open up to me about the things she was remembering, but the harder I tried, the more she pulled away. Things were starting to become strange around the convent as well. Every now and then I'd hear someone call my name, only to find that no one was there. Objects would disappear, only to reappear days later in a completely different part of the building. Some of the sisters were complaining of nightmares though they'd never talk about what they actually saw in those dreams. I had dealt with nightmares since the day I left Talentra. Over my time in the convent, they'd started to happen less frequently, but since the night Kate talked about the ocean, they'd picked up again. I'd wake up in the middle of the night crying for McKenna. I'd look over to see if I'd woken Kate up, but every time the nightmares would happen, she'd be gone. I asked her about it one day, when we were peeling potatoes for supper. Where have you been going at night? She stared at me. N nowhere. I've been asleep. No, I've woken up in the middle of the night a couple of times to find you gone. Where have you been going? I don't know what you're talking about. Fine. Don't tell me. Just don't get yourself in trouble. Father Adam won't hesitate to kick you out if you're sneaking off to see some boy. You were told the rules when the church took you in. You think I'm sneaking out to see a boy? I don't know what you're doing. All I know is that every night I've had a bad dream, I've woken up and you've been gone. It's kind of strange. So? What? You think I'm causing your bad dreams? We were interrupted by the pound of the knocker against the front door. That was strange. We weren't expecting any deliveries today. I looked over at Kate questioningly. She shrugged. She had no idea who it was either. We both slipped out of the kitchen and into the hallway towards one of the doors that led into the main hall of the convent. We were in a position where we could just see the door in a bit of the hall, but where we couldn't be seen by the person at the door. Sister Margaret was the one to answer the door. 
To my surprise, as she did, a tall woman with short brown hair stepped into the room. She wore full armor, and I could have sworn she looked familiar. Who might that be? Kate, do you recognize her? Kate? I turned my head back to look at Kate. Her face was pale and she looked terrified. She started backing away from the doorway. Confused, I turned my attention back to the woman. Can I help you? Yes, I'm looking for someone who might have come into your care recently. A young girl? She'd be around 15, with blonde hair and blue eyes. What business might you have with her? Whatever name she's given you, don't be fooled. She's a criminal, wanted for murder. I see. My dear, would you please wait here while I fetch Father Adam? I'm sure he'd like to hear what you have to- No need, sister. Whatever it is this girl may have done, while she is within the property of the church, she is sanctuary here. We will convince her to turn herself in, but in the meantime I ask that you leave. Your presence will only exacerbate the situation. When Father Adam appeared beside me, I don't know. I looked over at him in the doorway. He didn't bother to look at me. He knew I was there, but if he was angry with me in that moment, I couldn't tell. The armor-clad woman opened her mouth to argue. Father, while I understand you wish to keep the church separate from the state, I must insist- There's more going on than you would understand. I will write to the King of Talantra explaining the situation. I ask that you return home and wait my letter. Father didn't wait for her to respond. He glanced at me, making a slight motion with his head for me to go, then disappeared down the hallway. I looked back at the door. Sister Margaret was showing the woman out. I went back to the kitchen. Kate had disappeared. I spent the next hour finishing dinner while I poured over what I had learned. That armored woman knew Caden. I racked my brain trying to remember where I'd seen her before. Nothing came to mind. Why was Caden after Kate, though? What did she have to do with the murders in Talentra? That was the Peranian army. Was Kate from Peranis? Even if she was, she couldn't possibly have had a hand in the fire. Could she? By the time I'd served dinner, Kate was still missing, and I had remembered who the woman in the armor was. She'd been from Paranus. She turned on Queen Catherine when her husband had been executed for treason. I still didn't see what that had to do with Kate. I decided tonight I would find answers. I would follow Kate tonight if she left the room. Kate was already asleep when I'd gone to bed. That didn't surprise me. I watched her for a moment, silent. Whatever she was up to, I would find out. Whether it be tonight, or another night she snuck out on her own. I had to know. I changed and climbed into bed, pulling the covers over my face. I had planned to watch her until she moved, but found myself falling asleep. Another nightmare woke me. I shot out of bed, trying to regain my composure. In my dream, I had seen McKenna, murdered by a boy she'd come to trust. I saw Queen Catherine's face, but it had been Kate I'd been looking at. Kate! I immediately looked over at her bed. Empty. I threw off my covers and climbed out of bed. The stone floor was cold against my feet. I shivered as I walked toward the door. Quietly as I could, I pulled it open, wincing at the creaking noise the old hinges made. I froze waiting to see if anybody came to investigate the noise. But I didn't need to worry about that. Nobody was in the convent except for me. I slid out of my room, leaving the door open so as not to make that noise again. I headed down the hallway. It seemed the sisters all had the same idea as me. Their doors were open, none of them in bed. I didn't understand what was happening. The closer I got to the main hall, the more I could hear muffled noises coming from the chapel. I followed the sound hoping to learn the truth of what was going on. The noises grew louder the moment I left the convent. Across the path, I could hear they were coming from the chapel. Two voices were the loudest. The first was Father Adam. I could hear him praying, yelling at someone. The second was the most inhuman scream I'd ever heard before. In the name of God. I approached the wooden door that led into the sacristy. From here, perhaps I could see what was going on without interrupting. The door creaked as I opened it, but over the yelling and screaming I doubted anyone could hear it. I crept across the room to the archway that led out to the altar. From here, I could see everything. Kate was tied to a chair in front of the altar. 
In front of her was Father Adam and two other priests I didn't recognize. I could see Sister Margaret and the other sisters seated in the pews, hands clasped together in prayer. The ungodly screaming was coming from Kate. I couldn't believe it. Her skin was pale, her body rigid in the chair. If she hadn't been tied down, she probably would have fallen to the floor by now. Father Adam's booming voice filled the chapel as he demanded things of Kate that I didn't understand. How did you come to be here, demon? Kate began laughing in a voice that wasn't her own. It was deep and hoarse, icy and dripping with venom. <laughs> I was invited. Liar! No child of God would invite the darkness. She wanted an angel to save her, but she didn't get her answer. Her brother invited me. I've been here for ages, priest. She's given me all that I need, and now she'll burn with me. In the name of God, I demand you release her. Release this child and return to hell where you belong. <laughs> Kate screamed again in that horrible voice. I covered my ears, but I could still hear the sound inside my head. Demand all you want. The girl is mine. Everything she has, she has because of me. Her crown, her kingdom, all granted to her because her brother asked me to keep them together. <laughs> There's a pile of bodies at her feet because of me, and it is delicious. He was bragging now, but there were things it said I didn't understand. Crown? Kingdom? Kate was a nobleman's daughter at best, but surely she couldn't have been royalty. The only kingdoms for miles were Talentra, Piranus, and Rayaria. I watched in utter horror as Kate broke free from the bindings that held her to the chair. She rose to her feet and caught Father Adam by the throat. <coughs> Release me. You demand quite a lot, priest. Well, I have a demand of my own. I demand that you take this cross and shove it. <coughs> Before the voice could finish, Father Adam pressed a crucifix against Kate's forehead. Steam rose from her skin as the voice shrieked in pain. She backed away as he guided her into the chair, motioning for the other two priests to bind her again. This went on for hours. The sun was peeking over the water by the time the yelling and fighting died down. Father Adam looked exhausted. Kate looked like she was dying. Please, Father, just let me die. Let him take me. I deserve it. No, child. You must fight. You cannot be forgiven until you help me fight him. You've come so far. We will expel this demon and you can atone for all that you've done. Oh God. Does she know who I am? If she did, she hate me. She, like so many, will forgive you. Now once more, help me fight. <laughs> In the name of God, I cast you out, demon. Release this girl and return to hell. The girl needs me, priest. I'll never let her go. No, I don't. My heart swelled. She was fighting it. That's it, child. Fight him. Pray with me. In the name of God, I cast you out. In the name of God, I cast you out of my body. I ask forgiveness for the sins I've committed under your influence. This is my body. You will torment me no longer. The sisters exchanged looks as they held their breath. Father? <gasps> Color returned to Kate's face. She looked around desperately as if she were trying to find some familiarity in the church around her. I could hear birds singing outside. When the sun had finally risen? I don't know. What is your name, child? Catherine Valencia, or a queen of Baranus. My breath caught. My heart fell and my skin ran cold. Kate. Catherine. How could I have been so stupid? Anger surged within me. It took all my strength not to run in there and confront her about how she lied to me. I turned and ran, the sacristy door slamming behind me. I returned to my room and sobbed myself to sleep. I don't know when they brought Catherine back, but they didn't wake me. 
I dreamt of McKenna again, of her death, and this time, I clearly saw Kate in my dreams. Who she really was. A daughter of evil. The sun was nearly gone from the sky when I awoke again. I looked over toward Kate's bed. She was gone, as usual. I climbed out of bed and dressed myself. The first thing I did was report to Father Adam to apologize for sleeping the day away. He assured me it was all right, that everyone gets sick from time to time. Whether he knew I was there last night, he didn't say. When I asked him where Kate had gone, he pointed me toward the beach. Now was my chance. I headed for the kitchen, not stopping to talk to anyone, despite how some of the sisters tried to ask if I was all right. In the kitchen, I looked around, trying to find something to use. I settled on the largest knife we owned. I gripped the handle tightly in my hands as I made my way through the garden door and down to the beach. Kate didn't even hear me when I walked up behind her, but I heard her. She was crying, as if she had anything to cry about. She had been the one to take everything from me. My best friend. My happy life. Everything I could have ever wanted. I was happy just to see McKenna happy. And then this girl. This horrible tyrant queen and her brother stole that all away. I felt every muscle in my body tense up as I lifted my arms over my head. The knife's blade pointed down toward Kate. Wait. The knife fell from my hands as I looked around. Further down the beach, I saw him. A boy with blonde hair held tightly in a ponytail, wearing the same clothes Kate had been wearing under her cloak the day I'd found her. He was pointing toward the water. I followed the line of where his finger was pointing to see a glass bottle, tiny as can be, floating out there, catching the moon's light. I'm sorry. I looked back at Kate. She was on her knees in the sand, hands folded in prayer. I'm sorry. Uh, please, please, one day, you were to be reborn, you guys, we could be twins again. I stared down at her, surprised. Yeah, it would. She jumped to her feet and looked behind her, surprised. Uh, how can I? I stared into her eyes, unsure of what to say. My eyes drifted back to where the boy had been, but he was gone. You're up late. I guess we both got sick. A smile found its way onto my lips. If it was real or not, I couldn't tell. It felt real. Come on, why don't we go practice making brioche? She smiled through the tears, nodding at me. Yeah. I have a confession to make, McKenna. I couldn't bring myself to kill Kate. In some ways, she reminds me of you. Perhaps the Queen of Piranus is gone. Maybe I can help Kate become a better person, the way you helped me. She's gotten much better at baking. The brioche she made today? It was actually passable. I think by Twelfth Night, she won't poison everyone in the convent. The only thing I don't understand is, who was the boy on the beach that night? All right, on the count of three, I want all three of you to come back. One, two, three. I waited for all three of them to come too. The session had been going on for an hour and a half now. Miss Ioane's visions had never proceeded past the death of her friend, the girl called Mikena. I believed the presence of Miss Kagamine and her brother served as a catalyst to push Miss Ioane's subconscious through the rest of the story. This is... weird. It surprised me that Rin was the first to speak. This was her first session, so I expected her to take a little bit longer to come to than Len and Haku, who had been through this quite a few times. What is? She looked up at me, but her eyes seemed to take longer to focus. I could tell she was still having trouble processing what she'd just seen, so I turned my attention to Len. It seems, despite having died in your last vision, you still had a part to play. I... don't remember that. And I don't remember you. That's the weird part. I do. 
Everything she said. I saw it. I, I remember. Miss Ioane, you're quiet. Have you nothing to say about this? Not really. I've already said everything, but... If we all remember this, then these visions have to be real, right? It can't be some shared delusion, right? For these visions to be real, Miss Ioane, quite a lot of things need to be true. Len mentioned magic in his story, and your story mentioned demons. How is it these things aren't present in everyday life, if they're even real? I honestly didn't know what to believe. It was clear these teenagers believed they were all connected through a past life. If they had all met before, I might have considered them all to have made it up together, to be wasting my time with a lie that had blown out of proportion. But they lived in different parts of the city, and went to entirely different schools. Dr. Hiyama, Miss Ioane's parents are here. I reached over and pushed the button on the speaker. She'll be right out. It seems that's it for today. Len, go to your room and pack up your things. I'm sending you home. The look of relief and excitement on Len's face spoke volumes. However, I'd like all three of you to return for another session. I believe we've only scratched the surface regarding these past lives, and I'd like to try to dig a little deeper, if we can. Yes, yes Doctor. Yes, Doctor. I had been expecting a little more reluctance on the matter. It was nice to meet you. Uh, y y yeah, y you, you too. Haku didn't seem sure how to handle the sudden friendliness. I turned off my recorder as I watched the three leave the room and busied myself with filling out Len's discharge papers. Gotta admit, that's a pretty interesting story, Kyo. The man who sat across the table from me was Yohio. Not only was he my colleague, but had been my friend since high school. After Rin, Len, and Haku had left, I asked him to meet me for dinner to discuss the case. I'd given him some of the details without naming my patients and without going into a long speech about what exactly their visions were about. I've never encountered anything like this, Yohio. If it were just Rin and Len, I could see it being a pair of twins just having a go at me, but they've never met Haku before. For her to know these details, specific names, it's just strange. I don't know how to handle it. Where do I even begin in helping these kids? I'd had one drink too many and was getting a little too loud. Well, you're not going to believe this, but I've been dealing with the same problem. Now you're just pulling my leg. No, I'm not. A boy and his two friends, they're all suffering similar visions. All three had been brought to me for therapy after a suicide at their school. But each of them had gone into details about past lives. The same story, in separate sessions. I haven't tried bringing them together yet. I'd like to try. With them, and your kids. I don't know about this. If we keep feeding into this, we could lose our jobs. We're supposed to be helping these kids, not fueling their fantasies. Maybe it's not a fantasy. You said yourself you were starting to believe them. Maybe everything we knew about death is wrong. It's worth a try. You said you were meeting with them next week for another session? Yes, with Rin and Len, anyway. Haku's family is going on a trip, and she won't be able to make the session. Great. I'll bring Kaito, Miku, and Mako by, and we'll see what we can get. Deal? If I'm wrong, I'll buy you dinner. When she finished, I stopped recording. After reviewing her story, I could see where it lin lined up with Len. No, that's not it. When she finished, I stopped recording. After review... <sighs> Good start. All the way back to the top for Len. This is what I get for voicing two characters. But, you know, I didn't want anyone else to have to narrate this. And I was already Len, so... I was going to give Hakana to Kagami, but... As Kate restra restrained her strength... <sighs> She's the Hulk. <laughs> I grabbed a towel from the counter and walked over. 
waving the smoke from the oven toward the open door that led... Pleh. That's not until... Until? Nothing in my... Bleh. I don't know. Oh, wait. I don't know? Whoops. Fucking trucks. You don't know? Legend says that if you write your wish on a pa- <laughs> Legend says that if you write your wish on a piece of paper- <laughs> My brother told me. Motorcycles are a bitch. Let them die. You think I- You think I'm sneaking out to see a boy? <laughs> to see a boy? Me? We weren't expecting any delivery deliveries. I looked over at Kate questioningly. She stru she shrugged. Father, well I understand you wish to keep the church separate from the state. I must insist that you keep Damn it. Father, why I understand you Oh my god, why can't I do this? Oh, I keep messing the line up. Why? Oh. Liar! No child of God would invite the dark man. I fucked up that first little pause and it just snowballed into every other word coming out. After a second of... Ruiz! Me! Oh, I slipped into the old man voice I was practicing. Lines, I need lines. Where are the lines? Fuck you, demon. Fuck you, car. Fuck you, trucks and motorcycles and airplanes. In the name of God, I cast you out of my body. I ask you forgiveness for the sense I've committed. Fuck you, truck. I returned to my rube and- my rube? I returned to my rube. I'm sorry. God, please. I'm gonna do that again. It sounds like it just hiccuped out of me. It's not wrong. Help me. <clears throat> Car. God, please. Please. Fuck you. Fuck you, motorcycle. Or whatever it is. What are your wheels with loud engines that don't know how to get a muffler? Blah, blah, blah. Past stuff. No, and lots of people that are not me saying words and things that are written on this page. Well, typed, I suppose. You know, it's all the same as far as Blaze is concerned. Oh, look, there's a demon in here somewhere. That's pretty neat. And I guess these are priests and a nun. That's not bad. Oh, oh look, it's an epilogue. That must be me. Cool. Let's do that. It surprised me that Rin was the first to speak. This was her first session, so I expected her to take a little bit longer to come to than Len and Haku, who had been through this quite a few times. Let's redo that. That was such a terrible take. That's the weird part. I do. Everything she said. I saw it. I... Okay, who is racing down the road? Fuck. Dr. Hiana! Miss Ioane's parents are here! Here's your line. Dr. Hiyama. Dr. Hiyama. Miss Ioane's parents are here. I believe we've only scratched the surface regarding these past lives, and I'd like to try a little... Nope. The man who sat across from the table... Nope. Nope. I'd given him some of the details without naming my patients and without going into a long speech about what exactly their visions were about. This is entirely a breach of etiquette with patients, and I forget the word. What is the word? I don't... I'm, this is a bad joke. I'm going to stop now. 
Patient confidentiality. Got it. (laughs) I'd had one drink too many, and it was getting a little too loud. Also, I had just said that I didn't give any names, and yet here we freaking are. Good job with the patient confidentiality. Hey, guys. Do you like our content? Do you want to support the show? Click the link in the description below to visit our donation page. All proceeds go towards new and better equipment and games you want to see us play. Everyone who donates will get a special shout out at the end of future videos, and we're currently working on setting up some special perks for you. If you don't want to donate, that's okay too. You can support us by subscribing and clicking that bell icon so you get notified whenever we put out a new video. Happy Pasta Ween, everyone! Thank you so much for checking out today's story. So, last year I wrote a story based on the Story of Evil series, mainly my own interpretation, thrown in with a story plot I'd had in mind for a while. I planned on continuing it this year and man am I ever proud of this part of the story. I really love how this came out. I can't wait to share the next part with you. I really hope to keep this series going for a while. There's quite a few different series of Vocaloid songs I could go into. I also can't thank all of my guest voice actors enough. They work so hard to help me bring these stories to life this year. This is the reason I do Pasta Ween. I get to collab with so many amazingly talented people and I couldn't be happier. A big thank you to Izumi Yukimura, Hana Uta, Gen Dokushi, Arlen Adams, Erkman013, Sam Firewolf, Stephen Province, and Emily Haas Doms for helping me out today and a huge thank you to everyone who helped me this year. Make sure to give them all some love. You can find their links in the descriptions of each video they were in. If you want to check out yesterday's story, click that box on the left. Or if you want a revelation, go check out our latest Let's Voice Act series. Thanks for watching. See you all next year. Happy holla. I mean, pasta weed. <laughs>